morning, church. Um, just to kind of add to what Roxanne was saying about outreach programs, we have uh, last week or the week before I talked about um, Highway 218 cleanup. We have a section of that highway that we've adopted and we uh, clean it twice a year. We have the new contract sitting on my desk and they want to know if we would like to extend it for two years. I think it's a good program, but one of the problems that we have is getting people to help out with that. So again, I'm going to ask you if you have any input or any ideas, or uh, if you think it's a good idea, let me know. I've got till the 15th to turn in this contract. So a couple weeks. Um, another thing, we were at fall retreat last weekend and we had 12 teens that went, one counselor or one, one youth leader. I said I love the way you clap after the songs. Thank you for being here. We're looking forward to it. Yeah. Scientist was out in the highlands of Scotland studying the bell heather flower. And uh, he was looking at it, uh, at parts of them through a microscope when a shepherd came by. And the shepherd wondered what he was doing. And instead of trying to explain it, he just invited him to look through the lens. And the shepherd couldn't believe what he was seeing. And he exclaimed, my goodness, and I've been walking on these my whole life. We tend to take things for granted when they're just always there, don't we? We tend to not really stop and notice the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of the creation that we live among, even in our own backyard. But it's healthy for us to pause from time to time, and as these songs have reminded us, to appreciate the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of the universe that God has made, and to realize that it's an expression of the one who says that we can call him Father. Many of us have been reading through the Gospel of John. We're reading through the New Testament during the school year, and this week we did the first part of John, and I'd like to go to the first four verses of John and uh, read them with you right now. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Apostle John is introducing his Lord, his Savior, Jesus, and he wants to show us three things about him in these first four verses. First, Jesus is eternal. He didn't come alive inside Mary, when she became pregnant, he was already in existence before he was born. We sometimes talk about people coming down from heaven when they're born, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, we begin existence when we're conceived, but Jesus began existence never. He's always been in, in existence. He's always been at, with, in heaven. And uh, he's and in two verses, in two places in these first four verses, he talks about in the beginning. It's not the beginning of God. It's not the beginning of Jesus. No such thing. It's the beginning of the universe. Now, I can't grasp infinity. I doubt if you can. Infinity is just by definition beyond anything we can measure or understand. And uh, so we have this conception uh, that either something had to start everything. Something had to be there always. And the, there's really two choices. One is there's a God, as the Bible teaches, and that he created everything. It all came because of him. The other idea is that, no, there's not a God, but matter has always been here. There's always been atoms and whatever, and, and they've uh, made up the universe uh, the way they are. Maybe they were in some other form way, way back, but there's always been stuff, matter, or there has always been a God, a creator, a source. And we basically have those two choices, whether you're religious or whether your religion is science or whether you don't think about anything, you basically, those are the only two choices anybody 
uh, can think of. And so we have that. Well, we can't understand either one. How it could always be. Kids ask, who made God? Well, you, it's the same problem. Whoever made God, who made him or her, right? And where did all this stuff come from? Well, it's always been here or somebody made it. Now, the second thing John says is Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He's God the Son. And again, here's something we can't grasp with our minds, but the Bible tells us that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're three distinct persons. They're, they're three individuals, and yet they're so united, there's one God. There's one God. It's not a committee, but it is three individuals who make up God. They've never had differences of any kind. And so again, <clears throat> I can't grasp that, but the Bible teaches it. The third thing he tells us about Jesus, and this is our focus today, is that he's the creator. He made everything. Uh, some people, including many in science, choose not to believe in a creator. They shrug off whatever it, evidence there is. They say, well, that's not proof. Now, the crazy thing is, the same thing is true of evolution. They say, well, here's evidence, but that's not proof. You have evidence, and you have evidence, and what you do is you take that evidence and you say, what's the best possible explanation? And when you go, you go back to the origin of everything, your best explanation, you will take on faith. You will either believe in uh, something just happening without any help, or you will believe that something happened because there was someone who wanted it to happen and made it happen. Those are your two choices. It's always back to faith because there isn't anybody who's been there or there isn't any way to go back and see exactly what happened. But a materialist believes there's always been matter and that it exists for no purpose. There's no purpose. And it's just there. And somehow matter at some point in time uh, became li alive, parts of it. You got, these, uh, you got these chemicals that somehow mixed and somehow became alive. Just a little cell. And it was able to take nourishment. It was able to reproduce, which is a whole new system. And Darwin taught that, but Darwin had no idea how complicated cells were. A cell is like a little factory. I mean, it's got all kinds of programs going on. And uh, what we know now about cells is that's, co that's complex. Just one cell. And there's a trillion in each of our bodies. And, um, and so we, we basically, again, are going back saying, where'd all this come from? Well, I've been reading a book. Remember you old guys my age? Not many of us left. In the 1960s, Time Magazine ran a cover that said, Is God Dead? And uh, Eric Metaxas uh, takes off on that, and now he's asking, Is atheism dead? They were suggesting in the 60s, science is answering a lot of our questions with no need to explain it by some kind of a God, so maybe there isn't any God. Well, how about this? Science can't answer those questions. It's, it's raising more questions. Maybe it's time to say atheism is dead. There must be a God. There must be a designer. And uh, he talks about several things in here, and I, I want to share with you just a few about the fact that the universe we live in is so fine-tuned to allow for life, that it's a, it's a crazy astronomical number that it could have happened without a God. A hundred years ago, scientists believed that the Milky Way was the universe. With the telescopes they had, that's as far as they could see. Now they know the Milky Way is one galaxy out of thousands and millions of galaxies in the universe. And so as things are a lot bigger than anyone suspected even 100 years ago. The other thing is they had what they called the steady state theory that the universe had always been pretty much what it is, that it hadn't changed over time, and that it had always been there. It always, always had been there. And so when the idea of evolution came along, uh, they defended that by saying, uh, given enough time, Anything can happen, right? And so uh, given enough time, uh, chemicals could come alive and uh, a one cell could become a small 
creature and it could eventually be a worm and then it could become a chicken and then it could become you and me. That's the short version. Well, what happened 100 years ago is they built new telescopes. They built one that had a 100-inch uh, lens, and they not only saw the universe was much bigger than they thought, they realized things are moving. The universe is expanding. Now, the crazy thing is, a few years before that, a decade or so before that, Einstein had been working his numbers and come to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. But there was no visible proof. And he was so unsure of himself that he changed his formula, he put in something to explain that the universe was steady. He later said, that was the biggest mistake of my, my career, my work life, is I, I didn't believe the numbers that were in front of me. But when they got these bigger telescopes, remember a guy named Hubble and some others? Uh, they realized things are in motion and the universe is expanding at a constant rate. And Einstein said, I knew that. I wish I would have said it, but I didn't, I didn't want to take the flack of saying, how can that be? Because everybody believed the universe was fixed in size and it had always been the way it is and it's turned out not to be true. And uh, kind of in a... In a one of the guys who wouldn't accept that kind of blew it off and called it the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, everything must have exploded. And Well, that's how we know it today. The Big Bang Theory is that somehow the universe was set in motion at a time. Now, whether that's how that all works, I don't know. But it was absolute proof of one thing. Time had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. There isn't there isn't infinity for things to happen like evolution because time had a beginning. Now, they figured it was 14 billion years ago. That's a pretty long time. They figured life began four and a half billion years ago. That's a long time. I don't know anything about all that. I know what the Bible says. God spoke and created. But how he did it, I don't know. But what I do know is this, that it took away some of the uh, background, some of the ability to trust in this idea of evolution. Now, when I was in high school, there was uh, Carl Sagan suggested, oh, there could be hundreds, there could be thousands, there could be millions of planets like Earth. There could be life all over the universe. Well, all you have to do is you have to have a sun like ours and be there in a world about our size and be the right distance from the sun. If you're, the, if you're the, in the, on the right globe, a certain distance from a sun like ours, life could happen. Well, in that theory said there could be life all over the place. But the truth is, one by one, hundreds of things have been found that say this planet is unique. This planet is fine-tuned. Something is going on here you can't explain uh, easily. One is the Earth's size. We've got just the right amount of gravity. If the earth was bigger, we'd weigh twice as much. If it was smaller, remember pictures of a man on the moon? They could jump. They could all dunk it. They could have dunked it in a 20-foot basket. Uh, gravity, okay? Gravity affects the magnetic field. And that somehow uh, protects us from solar radiation. I don't know all this stuff. But we're not only the right size, we're the right distance from the sun. Uh, 93 million miles, remember? And if we were closer, we'd, uh, we'd be too hot. Farther, we'd be too cold. Closer, there wouldn't be any water. It would all be vaporized, and it would be in the air. Farther, it would all be frozen, and there wouldn't be much use to us. Uh, not only that, but we're on an orbit around the sun that's circular. If it was a big oval, sometimes we'd be a long ways away, and sometimes we'd be closer, and things would be more extreme possibly out of the uh, measurement of uh, what we could survive on. We have the 24-hour rotation. Again, we're facing the sun about 12 hours. We're away from it 12 hours. Not long enough to fry us, not long enough to freeze us. Uh, we're on an axis. It's just the right slant, it turns out, 
uh, not only to give us the four seasons that we have, but to accomplish other things. We have strategic neighbors. We have Jupiter and Saturn in the solar system. We got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Look at those big guys. They're linebackers. That's what they are. And what they do, they're so hunkin' big, they've got this powerful gravity, and when an asteroid comes wandering into the solar system, it tends to be attracted to those two big boys, and they, uh, and, and they crash there. If the, we didn't have neighbors that size, the estimate is that we'd have all kinds of asteroids crashing into the Earth. And it would be so destructive. One hit in 1908 in Siberia, Nobody lived there, nobody died, but it made such a noise and such a commotion when they went to check and see what happened, it had knocked down 800 million trees. Can you imagine, and you know how big it was? It was 300 feet across. It was about, to, about big enough to sit on a city block. And it, uh, if that had uh, blown up in the sky like it did over New York City, what would have happened? or Chicago, or anywhere. But we're not having that happen all the time because of our buddies down the line who intercept them for us. They're good, good friends, so say hi to Jupiter and Saturn if you see them in the sky sometime. Our moon is about a fourth the size of the Earth, 27%, and it has just the right distance from the Earth, and it's at an angle, and uh, it orbits at just the right speed, and it causes things like the tides, and so all the shorelines of all the oceans, the water washes this way and washes that way, it stirs it up twice a day, and it keeps it from stagnating, it allows life to flourish, and uh, mixes in oxygen, does all kinds of things. The moon is beautiful, but it does a lot of things for us, and that's one of them. There's some other things, our Milky Way, the galaxy we're in, we're in just the right spot, uh, that we're not just hit bombarded with radiation and we happen to be in a spot where we can see the universe we have a we have an atmosphere that we can see through and so God not only made us but he allowed us a window to see what else is out there and we're still looking we can't find the end of it but God not only wanted to make a great universe, he wanted us to know about it. Those are a few things that God has done. Now let me uh, have you watch a little video, and um, I'll promise to let you watch it if you don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles. The very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and light couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. 
In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life-permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine-tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine-tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that odds are life permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine tuned for life may very well be, it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Amazing, isn't it? You can find a lot more of those kinds of videos if you just put in fine-tuned universe and plug it into your computer. But it's getting harder and harder to justify saying we don't need any God to explain what we see around us. The more we learn, the more we see how complex and fine-tuned the universe is. I mean, uh, when you say a 10 to the 120th power, you're putting 120 zeros there. I've got one chance with all of this. Now, a thousand is three zeros, a million is six, a billion is 
nine, a trillion is 12, and they've got 120 saying you got one chance out of this. I mean, that's like expecting to win the lottery without buying a ticket. It's just, uh, it's statistically, it's just crazy. Uh, but intelligent design says, okay, it makes sense that if it, that's how it has to be, that's how it would be built by a, a God who made it. The evidence is staggering. With so many factors that have to be spot on, the suggestion that the universe happened by chance appears ludicrous. It's statistically impossible. I mean, if you ask a mathematician, here's the chance of this happening, they would say, well, then you're talking about something that's impossible. If a student is told by his teacher, you have a one chance in a thousand of graduating by spring, they go, well, I guess that's pretty much out of reach. How about a million? How about a million with uh, 48 more zeros behind it? You know, that's the kind of odds we're talking about. That's the kind of reality. And yet, uh, people are, scientists are, are, are um, all kinds of people, all kinds of attitudes, all kinds of skills, all kinds of intelligence, all kinds of things going on. But their basic job is to say, what's going on? What's out there? What's, what's in front of us? And how do we explain it? And there are still people who will say the best explanation for all of that we see is it just happened by chance. And um, they hang on to it. You go to our nature center, the new building, and it's all evolution all the way around on the walls. No idea uh, how that could have happened. No explanation how it happened. Just say, well, yeah, this is how we see it. Our kids go to school, they open their textbook. They're given one explanation. This all happened by chance. Life evolved. They're not shown these numbers. Well, this is the best we can come up with, but the odds are, you know, if you took one second out of all of history and you had to, you had to throw a dart and land on that one second, that's the same odds as this happening, it doesn't make sense to me. But they're not allowed to teach intelligent design as a possibility. Uh, it's wrong. It's wrong. Many top scientists are overwhelmed by it, and many are saying, as you saw some of them, some of them are believers in God, some are not, but many of them are saying, this, you cannot go back to chance to explain this. It's just not, it's not reality. And some have come to know God as their Savior and Lord through Jesus. And we're thankful for that. But uh, when you look at this, you say there's got to be a God and he has to have done it for a reason. Why would he make that effort? <clears throat> I read a book a few years ago, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And it, and it talked about how we need outer space to be exactly the way it is. We get our heavy metals on Earth from stars that explode. There's things they're learning that they didn't know when I was in school. Um, black holes. Uh, th then, just in the 90s, they began to discover that there's something they call dark matter. You know, you look at the sky and you say, okay, I can see where the moon is because it's reflecting sunlight and I can see the stars. But there's stuff out there that you can't see because it's not lit up. It's not making light, it's not reflecting light, it's just there. And it, there was a thing up there, it was over half the matter in the universe is dark matter. We don't even, I don't have any idea what that is. Just stuff. And then there's something called dark energy. Don't ask me about it. All I know is that we keep learning and learning and learning and it all comes back to how could this happen? How could this happen? Look at your own body. How does this thing work? I did a funeral this week for someone who was working on Tuesday. A couple people in our church said, yeah, I was at the restaurant that he owned. I was there Tuesday. Wednesday morning, he didn't wake up. Our bodies are so complex. Why did any of us wake up? But we do. God made us, and he put us in this universe 
because he wants us to be part of his purpose and his plan. One more thing about Jesus. I'm going to skip a couple of verses, Danny, down to Colossians chapter 116. For in him, in Jesus, it's very clear in the context, in Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all the spirits that are out there that we know a little tiny bit about, all things have been created through him, through Jesus, and for him. For tells you there's a purpose to it all. And then it says, he is before all things. He came before it ha happened. And in him, all things hold together. What keeps an atom, all those little parts in their little orbits? What keeps the galaxies in their orbits? What holds the universe together? Well, his name is Jesus. Now, there may be physical laws. There may be all kinds of things that we find out about how he keeps it together. But the ultimate answer is it came from him. It was made for him. And it holds together by him. And we're part of it. We're here. Here we are. This fantastic universe. I, I love what I do. I love studying the Bible, teaching the Bible, being part of the body of Christ. But uh, I, I could be, I could be uh, fascinated for a lifetime with science, couldn't you? Just learning things, just learning things. And nobody can get it all. They're, they're learning so much now, nobody knows any, any fraction of the whole total. If, if you're an expert on bell heather flowers, ready to settle down here below a whole lot of people that i wanted to meet a lot of places that i wanted to go but it didn't take me long to find out that there were better places i could be so i opened up the heavenly road map and found the perfect place for me i'm gonna be moving moving up to glory land i've been living down here too long gonna move as soon as i can on to that promised land I'm gonna leave my pain and sorrow Trade 